Hope that everyone has a great day today. If you would come inside and find your seats, we can go ahead and get started preparing our hearts and minds for worship. Appreciate your indulgence. Thank you so much. Thank you. We, a um, couple of announcements to get started this morning. We, um, on July the 15th, it's July the 15th, there's going to be a congregational devotional in the Family Life Center. That's July 15th at 7 p.m. And this will be part of our 242 worship, and we uh, last time we did it, we had a really nice turnout. A lot of people showed up, and we were able to share with one another, and it was a great time in the Lord. It gave us an opportunity to fellowship with one another. There'll be some light snacks there as well, and also for those of you that have children, there's going to be a treasure hunt. I don't know who's working the, are you working the treasure hunt? Oh, okay. Angie will be handling the treasure hunt, so for the kids, I'm sure it's going to be something really nice to do. And we look forward to seeing you all there. That's July 15th, 7 p.m. in the Family Life Center. With uh, regards to the uh, ice cream social that was scheduled at uh, Chris and LaWanda's house, it's going to be postponed until further notice, until we can... Um, get everything straightened out. Please remember Chris and LaWanda in your prayers as uh, LaWanda is recovering. So we wish it all the best and we're gonna get that thing going. And just to let you know, uh, my wife and I tried some sample homemade ice cream and it, uh, we, we think we're gonna take first place. <laughs> so just to, just to know, we, we got some extra time to prepare and uh, I think we got the, uh, what is it, the formula. I think we got the formula down. So we're looking forward to that. Please remember all those that are sick in your prayers. There's a lot of them, and I don't have all the names down, so I don't want to overlook anyone, but please check Vital Concern and also your prayers, um, the people on the Zoom calls and things like that to remember everyone who is sick in your prayers. Do we have anything... You got something? Come on. I just want to give you a quick update on missions, getting ready for our July 31st Mission Sunday. And specifically, <laughs> this is where our missions are. These are the eight places. I want to talk a little bit about Venezuela, Ecuador, and Uganda this morning, real quick. In Uganda, a man named Kisabi, um, I'm probably not saying that right, walked 30 miles to Kasesi, spent six months with the church there, and our brother Taliwabo Rabson. He became a Christian. He was baptized. He went back to his village and he stirred up the people, and they were able to go and preach there. And these are the, this is the group that <laughs> came, which was great numbers. And these are the kids that also showed up. And um, this is on the, in the middle is this man who, who was baptized back in uh, 2020. Um, in Maracaibo, they celebrated Father's Day Juan Vilma preached, and we don't often get a chance to look at the, at the parents that come, the families that come and get food, and the children are taught, but here's, they sent us this picture of the group, and I believe it was 58 adults uh, were there. I guess you better help me. And here is Benito Holguin who has been working in Ecuador. And he sent us a report and told us that, um, now this is some of his work. 
but he told us that he is going to leave Ecuador and uh, go to Venezuela. They had a lot of unrest in Ecuador. Um, the people in Venezuela are calling him to come back and help them, and the people of Ecuador were not as receptive as he had hoped. He told us about a church in, Ec in uh, Ecuador in St. Elena where um, a young woman was baptized and a, and a young man and another young man, and there is a, there is a volunteer preacher working in that city to, um, to uh, help the church, and this is his family, and that's it. So remember July 31st, Mission Sunday, and let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for letting us gather this morning. At the same time, many other Christians are gathered and uh, on this same day, remembering the death of our dear Lord Jesus on the cross. Uh, thank you for him and for the grace and mercy that you show us every day. Um, Father, be with us as we worship. Let your name be glorified. Help us to be edified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. So we're going to try something this morning. We're going to sing three songs as we prepare our minds and worship our Lord. We're going to sing three songs. We're going to try and go straight through. If I have to stop you, I'll stop you. Hopefully I won't. I don't think I will, but um, we'll go straight through. After the third song, we'll have our communion. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now.
Thank you.
Good morning. If you have your, if you have your Bibles, open to John chapter 18. Imagine, if you would, that you're in a garden. Um, perhaps you've been, you've been there um, throughout the evening, you've been with Jesus and his other disciples, and you, you spent the evening in prayer. And as you look out, you see a light. A few minutes passes, and that light keeps getting brighter, and it keeps getting bigger. And a few minutes passes, and that light's continuing to get bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter. And you can tell that it's a pretty large crowd of people. And as that light gets bigger and that crowd gets closer, you can tell that this is no ordinary crowd. In fact, this crowd is... Um, full of government officials and Roman soldiers. And as that group gets closer, they're coming right at you. And they are, you can tell as they get closer that they are armed with different weapons. And that's this exact scene that we see in John chapter 18. Um, John, uh, in John 18, it says... In verse 1, when he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kindred Valley. On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priest and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Uh, this story is told in all four gospel accounts, and that we are probably very familiar, you know, with this story. Um, we could probably, you know, tell somebody um, about this this event and the events that took place, um, you know, right after. Um, but I want to look this morning in, at John's account, um, and this is where I can see just how different I am than Jesus, because if I had been there that night. I would have run you over to have gotten out of there. I would have set a world record that would still hold up to this day. But that's not what we see Jesus do. And John gives us an, uh, some extra insight onto what Jesus was thinking. And I have read over this hundreds of times, and again, I could probably recite this. Um, but then one day I was reading it, and a phrase just step popped out at me. And it really kind of changed how I've looked at this. And that's in verse 4. It says, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him. So what did Jesus know? What did Jesus have knowledge of that he knew that was going to happen to him? So we know that, that um, you know, Jesus knew that the people were going to mock him. Um, you know, if, if we were to, to use our modern day terms, you know, we, would, we might say that Jesus knew that he was going to get made fun of or that he was going to get picked on or bullied. And if you've ever, um, you know, experienced that, you know just how extremely humiliating that can be, especially if it's in a public place in front of a group of people. But in Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 27, it says, The governor's soldiers took, charge, took Jesus into the victorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put on a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and they set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hell, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him, and they took, it, they took the staff, and they struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes back on him. And they led him away to be crucified. And in Luke 22, in verse, starting in verse 63, the men who were gathered... Uh, the, men who, the men who were regarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and admitted prophecy, who hit you, and said many other insulting things to him. So Jesus knew that he was going to be mocked. Jesus also knew that he was going to be um, beaten. We've already read of some, some, of those, some of that was talked about in those last couple of verses, um, but in Matthew 26... In 67, it says, they spit, on him, they, spit him, they spit on him in the face, struck him with their fists. Others stripped, 
slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? And then in Mark 15, verse 12, What shall, what shall, I, what shall I do um, with, with the, one that the, the one that you call King of the Jews, Pilate asked. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed, Pilate asked. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowds, Pilate released Barabbas to them and had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. And then Mark 15 and 19, it says, Again and again, they struck him on the head with their, with the staff, with their staff, and they spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. You know, make no mistake about this. The beating that Jesus received would have probably killed most men. Um, you know, I, my brain doesn't even let me process the kind of pain that he went through. You know, when I wake up in the morning and my neck hurts because I, I slept on it wrong, you know, I take a couple of Tylenol to help. I can't even begin to imagine the kind of pain that he went through. Jesus also knew that after the beating, that he would be forced to carry his own cross. In um, John 19, um, starting in verse 16, it says, So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. So even after he had been beaten, they made him, to add, kind of to add, injury, to add um, insult to injury, they made him carry his own cross. And then Jesus knew that, he, that, his, that his hands and his feet would be nailed to the cross and he would be crucified. In Luke chapter 22, in verse 32, the two, other, two other men, both criminals, were also led out, to, out, were led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place of the, called the skull, they crucified him there along with, with, with the other criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes cast by casting lights. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the God, if he is, the, if he is God, the Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. And they offered him vinegar, wine and vinegar. And said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Going down to verse 44. It was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until, uh, until, about, until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining. For the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, the centurion seeing what had happened, praised God. And said, surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this, uh, saw, saw, gathered this sight, saw what took place, they beat their breast and went away. But those who, had, who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So Jesus knew that he was going to die. Going back to... Um, John 18, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out. And he asked them, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Jesus didn't run. Jesus didn't try to hide. He didn't disguise himself. He didn't uh, lie about who he was. He went out, knowing everything that was going to happen to him. He went out. And he freely gave himself up. I am the one that you are looking for. In fact, uh, John's account tells us that his, aunt, his response to them shocked them. They even, they even fell down because they were um, shocked that, that he just would give himself up. In fact, Jesus had to tell them twice, you know, I, I am the one that you're looking for. Jesus knowing all that was going to happen to him. So why would Jesus... Put himself through that. If he knew what was going to happen to him, why would he do that? Jesus had free will. Um, I mean, Jesus freely gave himself up. Jesus freely went to the cross. So why would he do that? 
In Luke chapter 19, in verse 10, Jesus has a conversation with Zacchaeus, a tax collector. And Jesus tells him what his mission on this earth is. Jesus tells him that, his, that he came to seek, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. We are the lost ones that he came to save. In Ephesians chapter 2, In verse 1, it says, As for you, you were dead in your, in your trans transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. So we, were the, we are the ones that he came to rescue. We were dead in our sins. Going on down um, to verse 8. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And it is not of yourself, it is a free gift of God. So without that sacrifice, without Jesus coming to this earth and dying for us, we would have no hope. We'd be dead in our sins. In John, chapter, John 3, and verse 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned. Already, because, because they have not believed in the name of God, the one, the one, God's one and only Son. So this morning as we take the Lord's Supper, let's remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And let's thank him daily for, for that amazing gift that he gave us so that we can be forgiven of our sins and we can be in heaven with him one day. We're going to do a prayer for the bread and we'll do a prayer for the cup. Let's pray. God, we come before you now just thanking you so much for this, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. God, we're, just, we're, so un, we're so undeserving of that amazing gift and that amazing sacrifice. And we just are so thankful um, that you loved us enough to do that. God, we um, ask that we, as we take this bread that represents your son's body, we pray that we uh, take it in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray for the cup. Lord, we're going to come before you thanking you so much for your son's sacrifice for us. We pray that each day that we can just strive to be worthy of that sacrifice and that each day we can strive to um, try to teach others about you. God, we thank you for this cup that represents your son's blood. We, are, uh, we pray that we take this in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we have an opportunity to give back um, part of what God has blessed us with. There's several ways that we can give. There's boxes out in the lobby. Um, there's also uh, we can also give online, um, or you can give it to one of the one of the elders. So, let's pray. God, again, we come before you, just thanking you so much for just um, just how much you love us and how much you provide for us and care for us, and you have blessed us and more ways than we can possibly even begin to count. God, we just pray that um, everything that you have given us, we just pray that we will um, just try to use that for, for good and try to use that to, to try to serve you. God, we pray for the, the um, offering that we're going to be taking up and pray that you be with the elders as 
Um, they uh, use these, these resources to um, help further your kingdom here and around the world. God, again, we're just so thankful for you and just thankful so much for how much you love us and you care for us. And you know, we pray that we never take anything that you give us for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. This time, if you have children that uh, meet the age groups on the slides behind me, we have a Bible hour prepared for them. You can go at this time. The rest of you, if you'll stand with me, we'll sing one more song before Tim comes and speaks to us. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my Welcome, welcome. Glad that you are here. If you're a guest of ours, we want you to know that we are honored to have you with us today. A lot of places you could be this morning. Uh, glad that you chose to be with us. Those of you online, we're glad that you're joining us online as well. If you're anywhere here in Central Florida, come see us. Love to have you with us. Heard a story about two guys who were watching a baseball game one night at a sports bar, and it's the bottom of the ninth, bases are loaded, score is tied. The one guy turns to his friends and says, I bet you 20 bucks the next guy up hits a home run. His friend said, you're on. Next batter up, first pitch in, grand slam home run. Guy takes $20, slaps it on the table. His friend says, yeah, I can't take that money from you. I'm just messing with you. That game's a replay. <laughs> I saw it last night. I watched him hit that home run. His friend said, I saw it too. I didn't think he'd hit another home run. <laughs> if the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different outcome, then the Israelites of the Old Testament, specifically in the book of Judges, were insane. Because they kept doing the same thing over and over and over again and somehow expecting a different outcome. They kept looking around and doing what was right in their own eyes. Kept looking around and deciding we want to be like everybody else. And those nations that they copied all ended up conquering them, controlling them. They were oppressed by the very people that they, they tried to copy. 
You see, my lesson here is uh, Jephthah, a rebel with a clause. We have been spending some time this summer in the book of Judges, looking at the different judges that God raises up uh, during this time. And in Judges chapter 11, we meet this man by the name of Jephthah. Jephthah is a very odd choice to be a judge uh, uh, over Israel. He definitely is a rebel. He is an outlaw. He is an outcast. And what he is best known for is the clause that he makes, the deal that he strikes. He strikes a couple deals, actually, in his story. One, he strikes with the Israelites. But the one that he's most known for is the deal that he makes with God. We're going to take a look at his story, but I want to come back then and talk about it because there's some things I think we really need to pay attention to, some things we really can learn uh, from this guy, Jephthah. Like I said, Judges chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now Jephthah of Gilead was a mighty warrior, which is an interesting introduction. If you remember just last week, we talked uh, about the fact that Gideon was told by an angel, you, my friend, are a mighty warrior. And Gideon's response was, oh, no, I'm not. No one who knows me would consider me to be a mighty warrior. Now here, when Jephthah is introduced, it seems like everybody that knows Jephthah, including Jephthah himself, would agree with that, yes. He's a mighty warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also had several sons, and when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You will not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you're the son of a prostitute. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon he had a large band of rebels following him. So here's this guy, Jephthah. He gets kicked out of his home by his own family. He's basically in the middle of nowhere, kind of living on his wits. But he has some leadership abilities. And he attracts other misfits. He attracts other rebels to him. And his military exploits become well known. By the way, about 100 years later, a guy by the name, by the name of David is going to follow this same career path. Uh, verse 4, about this time the Ammonites began their war against Israel. When the Ammonites attacked, the leaders of Gilead sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. They said, come and be our commander. Help us fight the Ammonites. Now, usually when you think of a leader, when you think of an influencer, you think of someone with some education, someone with a very stable family life, very stable emotional state, now, not having a police record. That's a plus, you know, in leaders. Jephthah is none of these things. He is certainly an outcast. He was the illegitimate son of a prostitute. He'd been driven out of his home by his own family probably at a fairly early age. His family is completely dysfunctional. Jephthah was a guy who grew up quick, probably grew up a little bit mean as well. So when the uh, Israelites come, uh, we've been attacked by the Ammonites, they come looking for Jephthah, not illegitimate son Jephthah. Not get out of this town, Jephthah. Not, you're not going to get a penny of our dad's money, Jephthah. They come looking for mighty warrior, Jephthah, right? Isn't it amazing how forgiving we can be when someone has something we need, right? Now all of a sudden he's the mighty warrior. Verse 7. But Jephthah said to them, Aren't you the ones who hated me? Drove me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? They don't want to bring it up. Jephthah's happy to bring it up. Wait a minute, I remember you guys. We weren't so close not too long ago, were we? Why do you want me now to come fight for you? And to be honest, I love their honesty. Because we need you, they replied. <laughs> yes, you're a rebel. Yes, you're an outlaw. Yes, you're an outcast. But you're our outcast. We need you to come help us. And then to sweeten the deal a little bit, they offer Jephthah this clause, this deal. If you will lead us in battle against the Ammonites, we will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead. Jephthah agrees to this condition. He agrees to lead the people into battle. 
Verse 29 says, At that time, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he went throughout the land of Gilead and Manasseh, including Mizpah and Gilead, and led an army against the Ammonites. At that time, the Spirit of the Lord that came upon Jephthah. Now, we've already seen in this series that once the Spirit of the Lord comes upon somebody, the outcome is pretty much a foregone conclusion, right? I mean, victory is inevitable once the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Jephthah. And Jephthah should have known that. Jephthah should have been aware that God was with him and what God could do through him. And yet, Jephthah makes this deal. Sadly, it's the deal that he's best remembered for. It's in verse 30. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. He said, if you give me victory over the Ammonites, I will give to the Lord the first thing coming out of my house to greet me when I return in triumph. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. For some reason, Jephthah feels the need to make a deal with God. And we read that and we think, wow, how foolish. How foolish of Jephthah to feel like he needs to make this deal with God. And yet, we do the same thing all the time, don't we? You've heard that, haven't you? Hey, God, if you give me a job, or at least a better job, I promise I'll be more generous with my money. If I just had more money, I'd be much more generous with it. Hey, God, um, if you will heal my spouse or my child or my loved one, I promise I'll be more committed. Hey, God, if you get me out of this crisis, I'm going to re-engage at church. I'll be back, I promise. Hey, God, you do this, I promise. I'll do that. But here's the problem with that kind of reasoning. Nowhere in Scripture is there even a hint that we're supposed to withhold something from God. We're not supposed to be holding something back until God you know, gets us through it or we figure it out. You know, we're to love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. God says, you trust me in the middle of the problem. You praise me in the middle of the storm. I'll be with you. Don't you withhold a thing from me. I, I want all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. Well, God does give Jephthah the, the, the victory, complete victory. And then we read this. When Jephthah returned home to Mizpah, his daughter, his only child ran out to meet him, playing on a tambourine and dancing for joy. The story of Jephthah, it actually raises a lot more questions than it answers. And one of the first questions that I always ask every time I read this story is, why did God allow his daughter to come out of the house first? Why did God let her come out first? God could have made sure that some animal came out. Or God could have made sure that nobody was home. You know, nobody came out. Why in the world did God let his daughter walk out of the house first? By the way, I don't know why. I do know Jephthah is very surprised and extremely upset when he sees his daughter walk out. When he saw her, he tore his clothes in anguish. My daughter, he cried out, my heart is breaking. What a tragedy that you came out to greet me. For I made a vow to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. Let me real quickly kind of tell you the ending of the story, because I suspect some of you have never heard this story before. But then I want to get making a few observations and a few more questions for that matter, too. Verse 36. My father, she replied, you've given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I will never marry. You may go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and the girls went into the hills and wept, because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed. 
I told you when we started this series, the book of Judges is a dark book. This is a terrible story. It's one of the most troubling stories in all of Scripture. And again, it's a story that raises so many questions, not the least of which is, did Jephthah actually sacrifice his daughter as a burnt offering to the Lord? Did Jephthah really put his daughter to death? He vowed to God, whatever comes out of my house to meet me when I return in victory, I will sacrifice as a burnt offering. Did Jephthah do as he vowed? Did he offer his daughter as a burnt sacrifice to the Lord? And I'll tell you this, there's a lot of really smart people who have argued an awful long time about that question. A lot of scholars believe that he absolutely put his daughter to death, just like he vowed. A lot of scholars say, no, he didn't actually kill her. What he did was set her aside, set her apart for the Lord, that she would remain unmarried the rest of her life. And that was the sacrifice. I'll tell you up front, I'm not sure. I'll give you my opinion, and it's just my opinion. It's an opinion that's changed over the last 20 years. But after a lot of study and after just a lot of reading, personally, I think he killed his daughter. I think he, he sacrificed his daughter as a burnt offering to the Lord, just like he said he would, just like the text said he did. But again, I'm not sure if he did or not. Even though he had to know Deuteronomy, okay? He had to know that the book of Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, first five books of the law, which was been available to him, he would have had to know that human sacrifice is detestable to God, that God hates human sacrifice. But I think he did what he said. You know, for me, the real question is, why did he keep his vow? Why in the world did Jephthah keep this vow to God? Why did he feel like he needed to bargain with God? Why add the clause? Why make the deal? It's a question that kind of begs to be answered. It's a question that kind of brings this whole story closer to home. Let me share with you just a couple of thoughts. You know, we keep talking about this idea of the Israelites keep looking around. They want to be like everybody else. Jephthah was a violent man, and he lived in a very violent world. And I think on some level, he became desensitized to violence. You know, he, he just didn't realize how terrible this violence was. You think about your life, how desensitized we get to things. Things we know that God says, mm, you better stay away from that. You better... Pay attention to what you're doing, what you're watching, what you're listening to, how you're talking. But we get so desensitized. I, I think that had to play into this, uh, this action that Jephthah takes. It, it caused them to kind of lose sight of right and wrong. You know, other nations, that's how they worship their pagan gods. They offered sacrifices. And I think maybe that Jephthah just was in such violence that he allowed that violence to come alongside him, be part of his life. In the New Testament, we're warned of that very same danger. Paul writes a, a letter to some Christians living in Rome, and he tells them, to, tells them and us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. The kind of sacrifice that God wants from us is, is a living sacrifice, but then he goes on in the very next verse and says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll know what God wants you to do, and you'll know how good and pleasing and perfect His will really is. That's a command, by the way. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Can I go ahead and just state the obvious we are very good at copying the customs and behaviors of this world, aren't we? We are experts at copying the behaviors and customs of this world. Doing the very thing that Paul said, do not do this thing. Do not copy the customs and behaviors of people around you. Don't 
be influenced by people who are uninfluenced by God. And since I'm sharing some personal opinions here this morning, I'll go ahead and share another personal opinion. Again, this is just me. But I believe that there are a lot of Christians, in fact, I believe most Christians are more influenced by culture than they are by Scripture. And you might disagree with me on that. You might push back a little bit on that, but I believe that most Christians are more influenced by culture than they are by the Bible. And whether you agree with me on that statement or not, I think we'll all agree that we are all more influenced by culture than we would like to believe we are. We just are. You know, it's really easy for us to look at Jephthah and say, how could he ignore God's teaching that way? I mean, again, the Pentateuch, it's so obvious. You know, God talks about the sanctity of life. How could he just ignore that so blatantly? Then I wonder if other people living maybe in other times or other places look at us and say, how could you ignore God's teachings that are so obvious? When they look at our wealth and how we use it. When they look at how we've removed God from the very fabric of our families. When we look at who it is that we choose to love and how we choose to love and who we con conclude are, are worthy of being loved. How could you take something so plain and rationalize it? This story of Jephthah makes me look at my own life and wonder what enormous blind spots do I have? Because I know I have some. And you do too. What are the things that we just kind of refuse to look at? Refuse to acknowledge? Where is it that we're like, yeah, I'm not going to think about that. Yeah, that's just the way things are. Where do we rationalize our actions without, without realizing the spiritual implications? Here's a second observation from this story. Asking the question, why did Jephthah make this vow to God? Not only was he affected by the morality of his time, but also think that he was affected by this idea that he could manipulate God. God, I'm going to make a deal with you. If you do this, I promise I will do that. I'm going to stack the odds in my favor. You know, I want you to be a little bit indebted to me, God. So I promise that I will do this. I'm going to make this crazy vow to you. I'm going to, I'm going to leverage this vow, and I'm going to force God's hand. And again, it goes back to the pagans and their gods. How can I let you know how serious I am? How can I impress my God? Well, I'll do something kind of outlandish, kind of over the top. Which leads me to my third and I think most important observation. But before I get to the third and most important observation, let me share with you the question that I can never answer when I read this story. Every time I read this story about Jephthah, I wonder the same thing, and that is, why in the world did he keep his vow to God? I promise I will sacrifice the first thing as a burnt offering that comes out of my house. His daughter comes out of his house. Why did Jephthah feel like he had to keep his vow? Why didn't he just go to God and say, God, that was such a foolish thing I just said. That promise that I made, that was so stupid. I beg you for forgiveness. Would you forgive me? Why did Jephthah feel like he didn't have any options other than to keep the vow that he had made? Why didn't he just beg God for forgiveness? And by the way, I've heard people explain that by saying, well, when you make a vow to God, you better keep it. Really? Even if it's a vow to sin? Even if it's a promise to do something that God's commanded not do? E even if it's, it's a vow to, to kill someone, I'm supposed to keep that vow? Yes, this story certainly teaches us the importance of our words. Yes, once said, they can't be unsaid. Yes, People will only, uh, can only forgive you for what you say. They won't forget it. You know, I know all those sayings. Our words matter. Absolutely. It's foolish to make foolish vows. 
You know, a couple months ago, we went through the study of James and we looked at length about the power of the tongue and how important it is to use our words wisely. Still, I think Jephthah should have begged for forgiveness. Which brings me to my third observation, and I think it's the observation that answers the question, why did he keep his vow? And I think it's the most important observation. I don't think that Jephthah had any concept of a God of grace. I think he kept his vow because it never occurred to him that the God he served was a God of grace. He sees God in the same way as the pagans saw their gods. I'll curry some favor with this God. I'll, I'll promise something. I'll do something that's you know, impressive. And then he'll know how serious I am. Why didn't Jephthah ask God for forgiveness and spare his daughter's life? Short answer, he didn't trust God. Jephthah didn't trust God. In fact, he's kind of trapped by his mistrust of God. He seems to believe that God's going to strike him down if he breaks his vow to God, which is exactly the same concept of God that caused him to make the vow in the first place, right? This is why the story of Jephthah is so important. This is why it matters to us to read this story about Jephthah. Because I think too often we struggle with the same thing. We struggle with seeing God as a God of grace. We feel like somehow we've got to stack the deck in our favor. We've got to do something to deserve God's forgiveness. To deserve God's love. I've got to do something to make God bless me and take care of me. I heard a story about a man who's getting on a plane one day, and he sits down by a woman who's reading a book. Shortly into the flight, he interrupts her, and he said, well, what, what do you happen to be reading there? And she said, it's Scott Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled. And he said, what's it about? She said, I'm not exactly sure it was given to me. I'm just started it, really. It's supposed to be, I think, something like a, a handbook on life. And she flipped back to the beginning and she said, it's got chapters in it like love and discipline and grace. And the guy goes, grace, what's grace? She said, I don't know. I haven't made it to grace yet. I'm not sure that we have actually made it to grace yet. We talk about it. And we sing about it. But I wonder how differently we would live our lives if we truly were committed to believing that God's love, God's forgiveness, God's desire for us is dependent on his nature, not mine. It's because he is so good, not because I'm good. Now, Jephthah seemed to understand that he could trust God to be powerful. In fact, he was very uh, uh, proactive about recruiting God's power. He believed in an all-powerful God. He didn't believe in an all-gracious and all-merciful God. He was willing to ask God for deliverance. He didn't feel like he could ask God for mercy. There's a lot about this story that I still don't understand. And I might be getting it wrong, but I don't think I'm getting it wrong when we talk about God being a God of grace. Because over in the New Testament... Peter would write a couple different books, two different books, epistles, letters. We call them First and Second Peter. keeps it easy. The very last thing that Peter writes, the very last words that this old soldier of the cross, this apostle, this elder, the last thing he writes is in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Peter's this old guy, and he's sitting at a desk. He's just finishing up this letter, and he's wondering, how can I end this thing? What do I really want them to know? What can I say that they really need to hear? And he dips his pen in, in the ink, and he writes, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter, who probably knew better than anyone about growing in grace. 
tells his readers, tells us, you grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He doesn't say grow in works. He doesn't say grow in programs, grow in performance. He says you grow in grace and you grow in knowledge. Now, we, we got no problem with the knowledge part, right? We're very good at growing in knowledge. We spend a lot of time, a lot of effort trying to grow in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Rightfully so, by the way. Absolutely. But we don't spend nearly as much effort, nearly as much intention, trying to grow in grace. So We've got a long way to go in the knowledge part. We've got a long way to go in the grace part as well. Peter's not just talking about information for our heads. He's talking about the condition of our heart. Who we are. Whose we are. The more we understand Jesus, the better we'll understand grace. That's why the Apostle John, when he introduces Jesus in his gospel, talks about Jesus coming from the Father full of grace and truth. Yes, we need to be growing in knowledge and we need to be growing in truth. But if we are not growing in grace, those things won't do us a whole lot of good and it certainly won't do anybody else any good. We live in a world that is starving for grace. You know that. And we find it hard to give grace to other people. We find it hard sometimes to give grace to each other, right? Right? Hey, listen, we're a family. We all have banked some grace with each other, okay? Just know that. When I see you do or say something, I'm like, hmm, that's kind of strange. You've banked some grace with me. When you see me do or hear me say something, and you're like, hmm, I hope I've banked some grace with you. We need to be growing in grace. We don't give grace to our families. <laughs> The, the people that we're related to, that we love the most. We certainly have a hard time giving grace to people who disagree with us. That's why Peter says it's so important that you grow in grace. Jephthah never did. He never considered, let, let alone understood, God as a God of grace. And he and his daughter paid dearly for it. Max Licato wrote this. If you fear you've written too many checks on God's kindness account, if you drag your regrets around like a broken bumper, if you huff and puff more than you delight and rest, and most of all, if you wonder whether God can do something with the mess of your life, what you need is grace. What you need is the very thing that Jesus came to offer. May we today be growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and be standing. We're going to sing. Is it for me to save your life?
Thank you for participating in worship at Bay Area Church of Christ. If you have a prayer request or some other need, please let us know by sending an email to prayer at bayareachurch.org. That's prayer at bayareachurch.org. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.